Well, welcome, guys. My name is Jeff. I am the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society, the club that's putting on MACNA. I'd like to thank you guys for coming, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, James Fothery. Hey. Everybody go to the bathroom? This, this might go a little long. We'll see. I've actually tried to trim it down and down and down. I, I bit off a lot. I decided I was going to talk about uh, species that are new to the hobby. In other words, species we already knew about, but they've come into the United States for the first time. Some actual new species, some changes of names, and then I was going to talk about hybrids, and then all of a sudden I realized, like, ah, that's a whole lot to talk about. So I'm going to get going. Uh, I'm going to try to go a little quick, but if you've got any questions, uh, stop. Just raise your hand and ask me. Don't try to wait till the end. You'll forget, because I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different stuff, okay? Um, <clears throat> First of all, actually, I'm going to end up getting off the stage. Good thing you gave me that. Just for anybody that uh, doesn't know, I'm going to show you a couple of parts because I'm going to say a couple of words that will come up again and again and again. When we look at giant clams, uh, of course, they've got different mantles on top. And that's the fleshy part that sticks out. That's the part that everybody likes. Different colors, different sizes. Some are spotted, some are striped, so on and so forth. But that's called the mantle. Uh, when we look at the mantle, can you see my laser? Barely. There's always two openings in it. Down here, we've got what's called the inhalant siphon, and at the top, there's something that looks like a little chimney sort of that sticks out. That's an exhalant siphon. Clams, even when they're sitting there and there's no current, they're constantly sucking water into the mantle, and then it comes out the other end. So the inhalant siphon, outhalant siphon, exhalant siphon. So if you hear me say that, that's what I'm talking about. When it comes to the shells, uh, shells can be rather symmetrical, sort of fan-shaped like this. Sometimes they're elongated like that. So I've got a couple of different shells up here of different species. And lots of times they have these little things on them called scoots. And that's these little petals that run down the shell. So some species have scoots, some don't. Right? So those are usually diagnostic when you're trying to figure out what, is, what species a clam is. Other than that, a lot of them have a hole in the bottom of the shell, and that's called a bissel opening. And you can see some species have a really big bissel opening like this. It's just sort of typical for the species. Some have a very small bissel opening, some have none. There's the basic parts, all right? Time to move along. Uh, new to the hobby, with a name change, a pretty fancy looking clam. Uh, for years, we've called this Tridacna tavaroa. Now it's called Tridacna imbalivuana. Now I say it's a name change. Uh, these are found in a really small area. I'll show you a little map in just a second. But they've got a really small natural range. Uh, they also live down deeper than most clams. So a lot of divers or collectors don't come across them. Right? A lot of people that collect actually don't dive. They're snorkelers. So you know most of the stuff that we get in the hobby, if it's uh, picked up by guys out there swimming around, they're doing it on one breath. Right? So a lot of the deeper water stuff, you know, if you've been in the hobby long, you know like even like deep water fish and things like that always cost more because then you usually need scuba gear to go get it. Um, anyhow, this clam, uh, 1990, was named Tridacna tevaroa, which meant devil clam to the local islanders where this thing was found. Uh, recently, it's changed back to Imbalivuana, which is what it was originally called. And the problem was somebody had found some fossils, some shells of this clam, way back in the 1930s. So they called it a new species, described it and everything, but just based on shells. So then later, somebody found some live ones and they called it Tavaroa, thinking it had never been described. Then somebody figured out, like, wait a minute, this new one that we've got live specimens of, that's the same thing as this old one that we've got all these shells of. So the name went back to the original name, which was Imbalivuana. So now that's what it's called, mouthful. Right? Uh, it's a pretty fancy looking clam. And this is one I said is new to the hobby. Now we've known about this species for quite some time, obviously. Uh, again, just last year, for the first time, though, a few, a handful of them got imported in the United States. So that's why I say new to the hobby. Uh, the prices were in thousands. Expensive. But if you've got one, you've probably got one that maybe only two or three other people have. But maybe we'll see more of them come in. They are fancy looking. Uh, lumpy mantle, it's not smooth. When we look at the inhalant siphon, it's real distinct. I've seen different ones. <coughs> Different clams have different characteristics. A lot of clams on the inhalant siphon, you see these fancy tentacles that go around it. it gets that, that's that hole I was talking about where water goes into the clam. Some of them have very simple tentacles like this. Some of them have no tentacles on them. This one has these little bulb-shaped tentacles. So that's just something that makes it stand out from other ones. And no other species has tentacles like that. Uh, and again, they come in quite a few different looks, though. A lot of them that I've seen are seen pictures of the mantle really just comes up to the edge of the shell like this. Otherwise, the mantle actually comes up out of the shell and flaps over like a lot of other clams. Unusual, though, for sure. 
like I said, this is a, more of a deep water species. Look at most species of giant clams, they're really found in very shallow water up here. Maximus squamosa found down to about here, Gygus down to about here, Durassa, as far as what's in the hobby. We call that a deep water clam, and gigas too, because they can be found much deeper down than a lot of these other species. Then we look at Tevaroa or Imbalivuana. Uh, it's generally found only deeper than 45 feet, down to 110 feet. So that's kind of sort of the, the limits down there where we usually find coral. Uh, don't know of any being found in shallower water. At least nobody's talked about it that I can find. So maybe they only live in deep water. And again, that's why we re really haven't seen them collected. Uh, and again, they've got a really small geographic range. Until very recently, they were thought to be found only in parts of Fiji and parts of Tonga, just a real small area. Uh, now it turns out they've been found in New Caledonia, which is over here closer to Australia. They might even be on the Great Barrier Reef, so the range is sort of expanding. But again, they live farther down, so maybe they are scattered about over a greater range, but just nobody knows about it because they're down deeper. Nobody's looking for them. Most of the giant clams are up in shallow water. All right, next one. Another name change. Uh, this was the same thing. Somebody had found some shells that didn't look like the shells of some other clams. And they called this thing Tridacnus squamosina. That all went to a museum. Later, somebody found some live ones and looked at it and said, wait a minute, these things are different. This is a new species, so they named it Tridacna uh, costata. Just a few years ago, 2008. Then somebody put it together and figured out, wait a minute, this live clam we've got is the same thing as these uh, shells we've got over here in this museum, so Costata went away, just like the previous one. This kind of stuff happens all the time, especially when all you've got are shells and museum collections to go by. So it went from Costata to Squamosina. Uh, its range also got a big extension. Uh, it was thought to be found only in the Red Sea. You never get these in the hobby, by the way. Actually, I don't know of a single one of these ever making it in the United States, uh, which is why I didn't put near to the hobby up there. Found in the Red Sea, though, and then it turns out it actually lives all the way down the east coast of Africa, all the way down to Madagascar, at least. So its range has opened up. Uh, a few of these have gone into Europe. If you look online, you can find a few pictures here or there of them in people's aquariums. It seems like they're always in Germany. So somehow they're getting some. Of course, the Red Sea is a lot closer to Germany than it is to us. Right? So maybe we'll get some of these one day. Next one. New species with a new name that's an old name. This is a weird one again. Uh, if you like clams or you've been in the hobby very long, I know you've seen a teardrop Maxima before. They're usually pretty expensive, very, very desirable, very nice looking clams. Uh, so forever they've been Tridacna Maxima, but it turns out uh, that Tridacna Maxima, the teardrop ones, are not Tridacna Maxima. Any of them that have the teardrops on them, that turns out that's a, that's a different species. Uh, nobody knew it. Now I'm going to show you why in just a minute. Really hard to tell them apart except for the teardrops. And we really don't call something a brand new species because it's got some little different marking on it. Usually you kind of want more to go by than that. Uh, what's happened is genetic testing has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more and more people are doing it, more and more researchers. Uh, so some researchers were out looking at Tridacna maxima and picking up different specimens and doing genetic testing on them. Uh, and what they found out is, wait a minute, all of these maximas that have teardrops have very different genetics than all the rest of the maximas. There's something different about them. And so they started looking at them and they realized, like, hey, these teardrops, not only are they not maximas, they're not even very closely related to maximas. They just share a lot of common features. So again, primarily based on shells a long time ago, it had been thought that all of these were the same species as these. Then it turns out, hey, they're not. They're very, very different. Uh, somebody described something like this way back, if you look, 1798, and called it Tridacna Noe. And again, that's just on shells. So when this thing got found, when, when they discovered that the teardrops are actually a different species, they used a name that had already been used. There's still some arguing going back and forth right now about whether that was the right thing to do. But for now, it's called Tridacna Noe. Right? And I'll show you a couple of things. Based on genetics, Here's the current family tree of tridacnids, uh, which has changed significantly. I mean, they, they used to look at things like, all right, all these guys, uh, they bore holes into rocks. So they must be closely related. Let's put them over here. And all these guys, they live unattached on the seafloor, and they don't have scoots, so they must be closely related. In other words, you're just going on physical characteristics and sort of like where they live or life habit. Then you do the genetic testing and find out, like, oh, a lot of that stuff's wrong. Actually, this one bores in a rock, and this one doesn't bore in a rock, but they're actually really closely related. 
Uh, and so that's kind of what's happened. No way over there on the top right where the arrow is, they thought that was maxima. And like I said, it turns out not only is that not maxima, it's not even that closely related to maxima. Right? It's actually more closely related to squamosa and crocea. Right? It's very different species. So as genetics are showing us all kinds of new stuff. <coughs> if we take a look, though, I said it's hard to tell them apart. And this is why they were considered to be the same species initially. Uh, there's some different teardrops. They can have a wide range of looks, but they've all got those teardrops. And if we take a look, uh, it's always got a bunch of, a little bit darker color here with a light ring around it. And again, the, the color itself is variable, but it's always got that light ring around it. So we see lots of clams that have spots on them, or dots, things like that, like teardrops sometimes. But they don't have that distinctive light band around them. So if you ever find a clam, you know, if it says teardrop maxima or, or any kind of clam, but it's got those spots with the light ring around it, you can pretty much guarantee that's going to be a T no way. Right? <clears throat> if we take a look, this is something else. Uh, when we look at most of them, most, we see a lot of maximas that have this band of eyes around the margin like this, tightly spaced, and they're like little bumps on it. And those are eyes. All these giant claims have thousands of eyes on the mantles, really big ones. Not like ours, they don't make a picture, they can't read a book or anything like that, but they can pick up shadows and different colors, and if a fish swims over, they'll react by trying to snatch down the shell and close it, so it's their warning system. Very, very simple. But if we look, try to act in a maxima, like say over here on the left, it usually has a tight row of these right around the edge of the mantle, usually. Let's go ahead and make sure you got that part, usually does. Uh, and then we look at Noe, the teardrops over there, it tends to not have that. It's got more like these little pits, they're almost just like little simple dimples and they're kind of scattered about a little more. You tend to not get like a nice tight row of them around the edge of the margin, right? <clears throat> Here's the problem though, I said most of the time. Teardrop up there, well that one actually does have something of a row, not as tight as that down here at the bottom left, but you can see it's got a row of eyes on there and this one's got a row of eyes and these are more scattered out on this one. But I said not all maximas have that tight row of big eyes around the edge of the mantle. So this is a maxima for sure. So its eyes look more like maybe that one. That's also a maxima. You see it doesn't really have the row right on the edge of the mantle at all. It's just got a bunch of eyes kind of scattered on it, more like a Noah. That's also a maxima. Uh, and again, its eyes look more like that of T. Noah. My point is you can't tell one from the other by looking at the eyes. Right? There's some crossover. Most maximums have the row, most noise don't, but there is some crossover between them. Okay? So if it wasn't for the teardrops, you wouldn't know which is which. The same thing goes for the shells. Most maximums have a shorter shell like this. Most noe have a longer, elongated shell like that. Right? And again, they both have the scoots. So you can kind of see, and I'll show you in a minute, there are some that are kind of in between. So remember I was saying a minute ago, they thought uh, all these teardrops were maximums. Well, that's why, because there's sort of a a gradation between them. It would be really hard to just pick out who's who without the genetics and the teardrops. So those are typical shells. So you to look, that's a, that's a rather short maxima right there. See these little row of eyes around the edge of the mantle? That's a very typical teardrop over there on the right. Again, a big elongated shell. Hang on just a second. But a lot of maximas are in between. Bottom center, that's a maxima for sure. So it's got a shell more like Noah. So again, just looking at the shells, again, it becomes obvious like why somebody in the past thought like, oh, these are the same species. Because you can just grade from one to the other. Right? I just, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding your little pinpoint. So occasionally, if you could just tell us which slide you're on. Okay. I'm used to have, I, <laughs> I'm a professor. I'm used to having my meter stick and a PowerPoint screen about right here. So, And my dot looks a lot brighter usually, too. I'll try. Next one, a new species that's not a new species. You know, this is, this is a good one here. Um, all right, some guys were over here looking at genetics of giant clams, and they discovered, like, all right, teardrop maximas aren't maximas. Now we've got two different species. We've got maxima and noe, right? At the same time, basically, that was going on on the west coast of Australia. Some other guys were doing the same stuff, genetic testing on all these different giant clams. And guess what? Same thing. They find out like all these giant clams on the west side of Australia that are supposed to be T maxima, none of them are T maxima. They found them on Ningaloo, Ningaloo Reef over there, so they decided to name it Tridacta Ningaloo. So they gave it a whole new name. That's not an old resurrected name like those other ones I was talking about. That's a new name, named for Ningaloo Reef, okay? So <laughs> it's another weird one. 
it could easily be mistaken for tridactyl maxima. It's easy to see why they thought, okay, well, that's all maxima over here. We've got maxima over there. It's all just the same thing. But it turns out, again, that the genetics is very distinct. If we look at these, looking at giant clams, I'll tell you this, when you, when you look at lots and lots and lots of them, you can, you can start to identify things really quickly just by looking at the mantle, almost all the time, almost all the time. When you see some that are a little different, they sort of stand out. My best analogy for it is, uh, you know, every once in a while you can see somebody and just go like, that guy looks Russian. Like just that, that guy looks Russian as can be. Or that woman looks Eastern European or something. And you, just, you just know. Well, what if I said, all right, well, tell me, how do you know she looks Eastern European? Could you write that down? Well, her eyes or nose, something. It's kind of hard to put into words, but when you see it, you know it. So it's kind of the same thing. For folks that have looked at lots and lots of giant clams, you can, lots of times you can see the mantle of a giant clam and it can kind of tell you where it's from. Because they do oftentimes look different in different regions, even if they're the same species. Like Croceus from over here don't necessarily look like Croceus from over here. Or Gygus from over here doesn't look like a Gygus from over here. Like blue Duraces only show up on the Great Barrier Reef, and they're not over here, but they're still Duraces. So we get all these different sort of looks. When you look at these T. Ningaloos, they definitely look different. There's, it's hard to put into words because it's just a bunch of mixed up colors and spots and eyes and all that sort of stuff like that, but they look different. You get anybody that looks at a lot of clams, they'll say, yeah, there is something different about those. And like I said, the genetics got done on them. Sure enough, they are different. They're not maxima, right? They do have an elongated shell. They do have scoots on it like a maxima. So I'm looking down at the bottom row. Some of the shells are a little elongated like a maxima, right? So again, it'd be easy to mis mistake it for maxima, but it's not maxima, right? They tend to have a lot of little bumps on them. When we look at these things, when you look at the mantle, lots of giant clams, the mantle tissue is real smooth. Some of them do have little bumps, like maxima every once in a while will have some bumps on it. Crocea will have some little bumps on it on occasion. So it's not like this is the only one that has the bumps. But this one has a lot of them. And you get, they get bigger and bigger, and you get more and more of them as the clam grows in size. So if we look at a pretty big one like this, see how the mantle's got all these, looks like little warts on it? That's pretty distinctive. Up close picture, you see there are little fancy looking things all over the mantle. And there's some on this one over here too. So that kind of makes it stand out a little bit, right? But again, you would never, if you had two clams and they got the same shell and they live in the same place and all that stuff like that, I don't think anybody would say, well, that's got to be a different species because it's got bumps on it. And like I say, Maxima sometimes, sometimes has bumps on it too. So that's why they were thought to be all be the same thing. But the genes say they're not. And I said it's a new species, but not really. <clears throat> Actually, it's T. Noe. And this is the crazy stuff about genetics. So those guys said, oh, that's not Maxima, that's T. Noe, the teardrops. And these guys over here are saying like, oh, no, that's not Maxima, that's T. Ningaloo. And then it turns out T. Ningaloo is T. Noe. As different as they look. I mean, I just showed you, you know, the long shell and teardrops on it, and so on and so forth. And, you know, said, well, I didn't point it out, but none of the teardrops I showed you a minute ago had little bumps all over the mantle. Then we look at these, and it's like, well, wait a minute, how, how the heck can those be the same species? Uh, look closer. What's on the mantle? This one's got bumps all over it. It's a little hard to see, the one on the left, but it's got teardrops on it. They're real small, but those are teardrops. And we look at this one over here, it's got the line of eyes out here, kind of like Maxima would, but it's got teardrops on it. Look up close, teardrops. So this would be something kind of in between. Most of the ones, like if you see them in the hobby, the ones that are just like, that's just a nice teardrop, they're smooth as can be. Most of them. If we look at the Ningaloos, most of those don't have teardrops, but then we've got all of these that are kind of in between. It turns out they're all the same species. Check them out. Not covered in teardrops, but has some. Right? So there's nice teardrops, nice teardrops on the one over on the right. Crazy stuff. Then I found one in Bali a few years ago. This is in Indonesia. So this is Western Australia over here, further over in the West Pacific over here, and then Indonesia is kind of right up here. I came across this guy. There you go, it's right in between. It's got the bumps all over the mantle. We got those called papillae. It's got the uh, dimple-like eyes, like I showed you for a typical Noe. In some places, it's got a little row of eyes near the edge of the mantle. In some places, they're spaced out. And it's obviously covered in teardrops. 
So that's literally just right in between what we were calling Ningaloo for a little while and Noe. They're all T. Noe now, right? That's why it wasn't on that family tree a minute ago, by the way. That's why it's a species that's not. So that, that name has just gone away now. It popped up, pfft, right back away, okay? Um, for obvious, if you're trying to figure out what's what, because we, we can get some Ningaloo here. I mean, they have come in the United States. Most of they, they're really come from Australia for the most part, but we have had a few in the United States. If you're ever coming across something and it's got teardrops on it, all right, well, that's a T. No way for sure if it's got teardrops. If it doesn't have teardrops and it's got lots of little bumps on it or a few little bumps, well, if it's got a few, it's probably Maxima. If it's got a lot, it's probably Ningaloo, but you can't be sure, right? It's got a short shell like that, probably Maxima. It's got a long shell, probably Ningaloo. But I'm telling you, without the teardrops and without the genetic testing, you can't be sure which one it is. If you see something that looks nice and you like the price, buy it. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry about it, right? If you want to pay for genetic testing, get it done. Just be sure of it. A new species that is and has a brand new name. Believe it or not, I just found this last week. This is brand new. It's so new I couldn't get a copy of the paper. Uh, tried acting a Lorenzi. And again, for most folks, you look at, yeah, all right, it's, you get a white shell, it's got those things on it, the petals, the scoots. It's different looking. Take my word for it. Like, again, people that know clams look at that and think like, that's an that's unusual looking shell. It's not way out of the range of Maximo or Ningaloo or no way, but it's, it's different. Uh, so I did find the shells, that's called the holotype or the neotype, that would be in a museum, that'll stay there. That's like the one that they use to describe the new species. So that you can find online. Uh, found out where it was actually found. A very, very small area over here. Like an odd place to find a new species. Uh, but there you go. That's all I know about it. No pictures of a living specimen yet. I have to work on that. Maybe be able to find some soon. Right? Probably not going to see them in the hobby. That's where they're from. On to hybrids. Oh, I'm, I'm doing fine on time. All right. On to hybrids. Um, before I talk about them, because you know, in the hobby here, regularly, something pops up online somewhere, and they say, look, hybrid, this is a cross between this and this. I've seen some cross of numerous different clams. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, some of them maybe, a lot of them aren't. Usually what you see is somebody calls something hybrid because it's weird looking, it's hard to figure out what species it is, price goes up, right? You're paying for a hybrid, something different that nobody else has or that very few people have. So we'll talk about this for a little bit. Before I get to it, I'm going to show you some, some crazy things about giant clams. Um, the best that I know, nobody can figure out why they look the way they do. It's not, when you're bright blue and covered in spots or stripes or something like that, that's not camouflage. Uh, remember I said they've got the little eyes and when fish come up and stuff like that, they'll jerk down on the shell. <laughs> numerous, numerous times. You're out diving, swimming around on a reef. There can be a clam right there I might not have even noticed, except for that when you get within a couple of feet of it, it <laughs> shuts up and jerks down on the shell. I said, you know, if you just sat still, that would have gone right by. And so sometimes it seems almost like self-defeating. And again, it's just, even when they are kind of camouflaged, they'll give themselves away by jerking around. So nobody can figure it out. When it comes to genetics and like trying to figure out what they're going to look like, for the most part, nothing seems to work. Uh, people for years have like blue squamosas, big money. Those are expensive. People have taken like two blue squamosas, crossbreed them. None of the babies are blue. Like, why not? Uh, other times I've heard of taking two squamosas and neither one of them is blue, and all of the babies are blue. Nobody can figure that one out either. Um, they're called rare here in the hobby. Anytime you see one, they're like, rare blue squamosas, rare blue squamosas. But I visited a farm in Indonesia a few years ago, and they basically just said every time we produce these things, every time, about 10% of them are blue. That's not rare, all right? On average, you know what they told me? Japanese will pay a lot more money for them than Americans. They just all go to Japan. They're not rare. They're rare in the United States. That's what I was told anyway. Um, guy did these on a farm. Told me that every clam in that picture was from one single spawning event from the same parents. So 
taking two clams, eggs from one, sperm from another one, boom. You get all that. You how different they look. Some have stripes, some have spots, some have nothing. Some are really colorful, some not so colorful. It's hard to figure out. It's really just sort of a mystery why, why it's such a, a mess when you try to spawn these things. It's completely unpredictable. So we can get a lot of variability, okay? <clears throat> a lot of species can also look alike. Uh, and again, if you look at enough giant clams, it becomes obvious. You just sort of know what to look for, like the eyes, the pattern, uh, the shell, and all sort of stuff like that. But most folks, if you just look at a couple of clams, you don't know much about them. Those are actually pretty similar. I mean, they've got dark stuff, light stuff. There's kind of a blue or teal rim around the outside. There's some eyes on the margins out here. Ah, that's, those are two completely different species, though. There's not, they're not even closely related, right? Likewise, uh, there's Squamosina, the one from the Red Sea I was talking about, the West Coast Dada that got its name, name changed. That's one on the left right there. That's a Squamosa on the right. Those look pretty similar. I mean, pretty close to each other. And look, big scoots, like really big scoots over here, really big rows of scoots over there on the right. Light and dark, splotchy. Again, those are not the same species, okay? They just happen to look a lot alike. For that matter, there's a Tridacna crocea, there's a Tridacna durasa, there's a Tridacna squamosa. So again, three different species. And those are unusual mantle patterns for all three of those, really. It's not very common, but there you go. The colors might be slightly different, but again, you get the same, pretty much the same basic pattern. So you gotta really know what you're looking for to figure out what's what sometimes, right? <clears throat> now, also, you get weird clams on occasion. Lots of just individuals, they're what we call them atypical, freaks, something like that, odd things. Anybody want to guess what species that is? If you saw it, what would you think? This one isn't even that hard. <laughs> this is the easy question. This is the starter. I got another one coming up. She said Crocea. That'd be a good guess. It's, uh, Actually, it's probably the best guess, probably. Got a few little scoots at the top, though. Crocea usually doesn't have scoots, but sometimes it does. That's the tough part. That's a maxima. I know because I ate it. I had a weird shell. Uh, there was a restaurant in Okinawa that had lots of live giant clams, and here's what really hurts your feelings. Five bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all of them. Five bucks. I was like, so not only is that way cheaper than any giant clam you can get here, it's cheaper than regular sushi. I just take it out of the tank live and just chop it up for you right there. So, I mean, I, I know for sure that's a maxima. It's a weird shell for a maxima, but I know it was a maxima, right? I'd wipe that one out. Okay, anybody want to guess? Obviously, it's not what it looks like, or I wouldn't be asking. What did I tell you about T. Noe? Showed you all those pictures of T. Noe with the long shell, and it said some Maximas have a long shell like T. Noe. Well, some T. Noe have short shells like Maxima, like weird Maximas. That's a teardrop. Would have never guessed. Like, if you'd showed me that without the mantle in there, I would have never thought that was a Maxima. I would have just been kind of stumped by that. It's got weird scoots on it, but if anything, I would have said it's a weird Squamosa, maybe. It's just such a short shell. But again, that's just a weird one, right? How about that? I don't know what that cost. <laughs> Probably a lot. Uh, every once in a while we see things like this. And again, if you look online, you'll, you'll find it's, it's not like this is the only one that's ever happened. Every once in a while we get some of them that have like one side of the mantle is blue and the other side's orange or, or splotched like that. So we're, again, these are just sort of unusual things. It does not mean that's some weird hybrid. It's a, just a weird clam. That's a crocea plain as day. I mean, that is absolutely positively a crocea. It's just got a really strange mantle, right? <clears throat> Even weirder, you got the big hole that goes in, and I said there's a little chimney-like thing, the exhalant siphon where the water comes out. Here's what I stumbled across. It had three exhalant siphons. It's only supposed to have one. Two would be strange enough, this one had three. So again, strange things happen. That doesn't mean it's some kind of hybrid or something like that. It's just a weird clamp. It was perfectly normal. The thing was that big. It seemed to be doing fine. It just had three exhalant siphons. It could poop in a third the time. Right? So when it comes to this question of hybrids, I, I'll just, 
I'm a science teacher. We'll just go right back to the scientific method. First thing you do, ask a question, right? Do hybrids exist? Because there's a lot of controversy about this, right? Uh, ask my question, do hybrids exist? First thing you want to do, go out and gather as much information on the topic as you can. It right, would be the same thing you do in any other scientific study. All right, what information? What can I look for to see if hybrids exist? Um, let's look and see if some other types of clams can hybridize. That'd be a good place to start. If you're not sure about giant clams, let's see what else we've got. Uh, look for previous studies. Let's see if anybody else doing research, like in a lab, you know, under, under lab conditions, has created any kind of hybrids already. Maybe that information's out there and you just don't know about it. Um, I'll tell you this real quick, too. You know, it's been a few years now, but I wrote a big book on giant clams that some of you might have seen. Um, you know, there was one small book that had been written 10 years before that in German on giant clams, and that was really like the only book on giant clams at the time, and it went out of print, which is why I decided, it's a perfect time, I'll write one. I'll have the only book in print on giant clams. Um, <clears throat> I decided to start looking in the scientific literature all that research that's out there. But I'm going to work on this new book. I don't want to just talk to a bunch of hobbyists. Come on. I've got lots of good anecdotal information, but I want to see if there's any science out there. Uh, it took me a matter of a few days to come up with about 3,000 pages of scientific literature. That's all peer-reviewed stuff. And it just turned out like everywhere I looked, like, oh my gosh, there's a, somebody's actually researched that. And somebody's already done that, and somebody's already answered that question, and somebody's already answered that one. Somebody's, it just, Stacks and stacks and stacks. I spent a lot of money on photocopies, right? It's the same thing. A lot of these questions that we have in the hobby, it doesn't mean that it hasn't already been answered by somebody. Um, just in the past, we were not very good at looking. Nowadays, we've got that thing, though, called the Internet. It wasn't that long ago where if you want to find out, like, has somebody already done this? You get, it sounds crazy now, doesn't it? You had to go to the library look through databases and things like that. And then I remember having like CD-ROMs and stuff where you could search for things. Now you just look on the internet. Hybrid giant clams or hybrid tridacna. You know, all kinds of stuff comes up. Anyhow, so <clears throat> look for previous studies. Uh, look for less than anecdotal information. All right, so let's do talk to some hobbyists and maybe talk to some clam farmers, some guys that maybe aren't necessarily scientists. And they're not doing it in a lab, like under, you know, tightly controlled conditions, but people that are out there breeding giant clams for a living. All right, talk to them, and then uh, take a look at some pictures. I've actually never seen a hybrid giant clam I, with my own eyes, like taking a picture of it. But you go online, you can find lots of pictures of them. So we'll take a look at some of those pictures of hybrids, right? Um, first thing I said, let's look for evidence that other clams can hybridize. Well, it turns out in the scientific literature, there have been some scallops that have been intentionally hybridized. They don't really, it doesn't really happen in the wild. Uh, but they've been able to do it on basic clam farms, like aquaculture facilities. So we know some scallops can. There have been a couple of hard clams, like mercenary, these big clams, quahogs, and stuff like that, um, and a couple of oysters that have been hybridized. And those are all clams, and we're talking about giant clams. So if you can do it with these clams, why shouldn't giant clams be able to do it? At least some of them. Maybe not like all giant clams in any combination, but maybe some of them can do it. All right? So that's a good starting point right there. There's no reason to think it can't happen. Okay, I will throw this in though. The odds of finding a hybrid in the wild, you can't say it's zero. It's called a non-zero probability. In other words, you can't really say zero chance, but it's effectively zero. I mean, the odds of that happening, of a hybridization on the reef, and one of those things living to adulthood, is practically zero. I would be shocked if somebody found one. It was truly a hybrid. Um, and same thing here, these things that have been hybridized, but you don't really find them in the wild. These have been done in aquaculture facilities, okay? Uh, I do want to point out they were all, every time this has worked, it has always been closely related species. Actually very closely related species. Not like different types of clams, like a scallop and an oyster or something like that, or not even distantly related scallops. Okay, closely related scallops. <coughs> uh, I put a thumbs up over there, that's good. Right? Look for some previous studies. Back in 1988, um, some guys tried to crossbreed a couple of closely related clams, a couple of close species. And this was on a farm. Again, not really in a lab, but at an aquaculture facility. Right? They did it. Those, if we look at my 
tree over here, you see that Hippopus, Hippopus, and Hippopus porcelain, it's very, very closely related species. They feel that's a good place to start. Let's see if we can get these guys to hybridize. Right? So that's a, by the way, that's a Hippopus on the top and a porcelain on the bottom. Every once in a while, we'll get a Hippopus in the species. You'll see them for sale. Um, live Aquaria has them on occasion and a couple other places. So they come in. Uh, Porcelanus, I've seen one and I bought it because I've only seen one, so I, I'll take it. And that, that costs some money, but take it. So that's it. So they have been here in the United States, but we don't really get them regularly, right? Um, anyhow, so they crossed these things, came up with some hybrids, super high mortality. All right, out of tens of thousands of fertilized eggs, uh, if I remember right, I think it was about a half dozen actually survived more than a few days. All right, and that's common. Listen, when they do these things on farms, I mean, these things, I'll, I'll say more about it in just a second. They put out millions and millions of sperm and eggs, sometimes hundreds of millions in one spawning event. Almost every bit of that dies. It's a numbers game. That's why they put out so much. If they didn't, they'd go extinct, right? <coughs> Turns out, so they made these hybrids. They had a few that survived, and they said, okay, we successfully crossed Porcelanus with Hippopus. So we've got a few of these things that have survived, and they got about this big. And they were weird looking. They were sort of different. They didn't look like a regular Hippopus. They didn't look like a regular Porcelanus, right? Some other guys later, though, came back, and they said, oh, wait a minute. They did genetic testing. It turns out they were just uh, self-fertilized eggs, right? They self-fertilized. What does that tell you? They make sperm and eggs. Something odd about them, too. All these giant clams are simultaneous hermaphrodites. They're males and females. When they're fully mature, as they start to grow and grow, they first develop testes. They'll spawn on occasion, but they only spew out sperm. Then as they mature, they grow ovaries. Then when they spawn, they'll spew out sperm. Then they'll spew out eggs. Their own sperm and eggs can mix and self-fertilize. Right? Obviously, the idea is your sperm should go mix with somebody else's eggs, and your eggs should go get fertilized by somebody else's sperm. Uh, but it can happen. It probably happens essentially every time a clam spawns. Now, here's how it's supposed to go. Uh, ideally, a giant clam, when it starts to spawn, let's say it's fully mature, so it's got male and female. Uh, it will spew out sperm, and it basically coughs. You'll see that thing contract, and the shell will close like this, and so it, it starts to put out the sperm, and it'll put out clouds of sperm. And again, in case it's hundreds of millions, it's not like it's thousands or something, it's millions and millions of sperm into the water. Typically, that'll slow down, slow down, maybe even just completely come to a stop. You might have a little break in there for a couple of minutes. Boom, then it starts going again, except here come the eggs. So you try to split them up a little bit. That cuts back on self-fertilization because you're in the ocean. So the idea would be you pump out all this sperm, well, you got currents and waves and all that kind of good stuff like that that spread that sperm all over the place. Then you put your eggs out, and those get spread out. So that increases the chance that you know, your sperm are going to meet with somebody else's eggs and vice versa, right? The problem is there's not always a distinct gap between the sperm and the eggs. And if something's spitting out all these sperm, when the eggs start coming out, you can pretty much guarantee there's still some sperm that's lingering out of there, right? And that's why I say probably in most cases you're going to have some, some self-fertilization every time a clam spawns, right? Uh, what these guys that did the genetic testing on that other one, what they suspected was, uh, you, the way it's supposed to go is you take a clam, basically you put it in a bucket or a container, it puts out the sperm. When it stops putting out the sperm, you grab it, rinse it off, put it in a different bucket. Then you get the eggs. Then you do the same thing for another clam. Then you mix sperm from this one with the eggs from this one. And that's how it's supposed to work. But if you don't rinse that clam off really well, there might still be some sperm on it. Or if you took it out before it was quite finished with the sperm and put it over here, well, then you've got a little bit of sperm mixed in with your eggs. Or if it starts pumping out eggs and there's still a little bit of sperm lingering around and kind of coming out, again, it's really hard to keep all this stuff straight. Also, the gametes, the sperm eggs, they start to die very quickly. So when you do all this, it's got to be fast. It seems like, well, you know, why don't they just take a scoop and check it all out with a microscope? Well, Sperm's really hard to see, it's small. Eggs are easy to see. Sperm's really small, hard to see, and it'd be hard to do all that, again, on some aquaculture facility somewhere. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it'd be difficult, right, to make sure you've only got sperm and you've only got eggs. It's gonna be very difficult, right? And so that's what they think happened with those. 
with the Apophis and the Porcelanus. Somehow they got some sperm and eggs from the same clam mixed up, and you had self-fertilization, and they weren't hybrids. Okay? So that's why I put a thumbs down on that one. Whoops. So that's not evidence for hybrids anymore. Uh, here was another one. Recently, 2013, uh, some researchers took some Maximus, and spawn those. They took some noes, some teardrops, and spawn those, and then tried to make a cross of the two. Um, lots of maximus survived, lots of noes survived. They did get a few fertilized eggs all right, when they tried to cross the two. All right, so they did make what they thought were, apparently they made some hybrids. They got some of the eggs from one of them to hook up with some of the sperm from the other one. Boom. Um, they all died, though. So at first they said success, because even if they died at some later time, at least you got them to fertilize. You got sperm and the eggs to come together, so technically that would just be a really, really short-lived hybrid. Very short-lived. Uh, but again, noise over here, Maxima's over here. When I'm showing you this chart, to keep something in mind, it's hard to tell time on something like this. Uh, when we look at genetics, there's something called the genetic clock. It's an estimate. But when we look at like mutation rates and all these sorts of things like that in genes, uh, researchers oftentimes will try to put some sort of a time on things. When you look at something like this, it looks like, hey, Squamosa and Crocea way over there on the right, look how closely related they are. They've got a common ancestor. Right? Like somewhere at the base of that V, there was a common ancestor, and that evolved into Crocea and Squamosa over there. Yeah, a few million years ago. When we look at like Maxima's over here and Noe's over there, several million years between their last common ancestor. So when I say they're not that closely related, there's millions of years between them, right? That doesn't mean they can't hybridize, don't get me wrong. But again, if you're trying to get something as closely related as like Hippophis and Porcelanus, you can't get that to work. It seems like odds would be even smaller that you could get something further apart from each other to hybridize. Doesn't mean you can't. Um, <coughs> Thought they got it right, but all the eggs that got fertilized, almost all of them died the first day. All of them were dead by the next day. They never got big enough to do any genetic testing on them, on those, to see if that's what they really had. So I put a not a thumbs up, not a thumbs down. You know what I think probably happened? Cell fertilization. Same as the other one. Can't be sure, that's why I didn't give it a thumbs down. No genetic testing. But it, when you read through the stuff and how they did it and all, it would be really easy to see, like, uh, I bet they got some sperm and eggs from one of the clams kind of mixed together, all right? And again, it's really low, excuse me, really low survival rates when that happens. Like I said with the Hippopus, it's th tens of thousands of fertilized eggs and only, like I said, about half a dozen of them survived or so. Well, sounds a lot like this. Can't be sure, though. Um, Anecdotal information. Oh, the internet. As I call it, the blessing and the curse. The internet's great and terrible. Uh, if you look online or shops or anything like that, you can find some things called Maxeas that are supposed to be crosses between Maxima and Crocea. I've just seen several of those over the years. They kind of pop up here and there on the market. Maxima and Noe. Um, Squamosa crocea, which is Squamosea. I'll show you some of that stuff in a minute. Squamosa maxima, Durasa and Gygus. A Durasa and Gygus, never seen anything like that uh, on the market or pictures of it really, but I've seen pictures of one. I couldn't figure out where that came from. I'd heard some people talk about it online. I said, where'd that even come from? All the way back to 1994, Reef Aquarium Volume 1. Julian Sprong had come across some clams that looked kind of weird and thought that they were maybe a cross between Durasa and Gygus. I asked him about it later, and he said, ah, changed his mind. They were just weird-looking terraces. <laughs> so, we just, so we can just get rid of that. Because it happens. I mean, like I, like I showed you, I mean, sometimes you just get weird-looking clams. That does not mean they're a hybrid. Or it looks like something in between this one and this one. That doesn't mean it's a cross between them. It's just something that looks like it's in between this one and this one. Um, <clears throat> Maxea, this is one of the most common ones that we see offered in the hobby that's supposed to be a hybrid. And there's a handful of people that will just tell you, no doubt. That's exactly what that is. We'll see. Maxima and Crocea, right? It's a communication with uh, the importer of these. 
All right, this is supposed to be a Maxima Crocea. All right, he said that uh, teardrop shows only colored teardrop Maxima clams. All right, well, what's the problem already? If it's a teardrop, it's not Maxima. Although, as somebody pointed out to me, well, some, it might have just been like a spotted Maxima, because some Maximas do have spots. So maybe that's what he's talking. Can't be sure without pictures of the clams they used. Can't be sure. But I'll bet there were no one. Uh, and then said 65% uh, of the clam, well, wait a minute, I forgot. Left some croceas in the tanks with them. Too lazy to take them out. All right, so they were trying to get uh, maximas, or no ways. Left some croceas over here. When these guys start to spawn, they give off a lot of chemicals, spawn and do some pheromones. And lots of times when some clams start to spawn, it makes all the rest of the clams start to spawn. So now we've got maximas, no ways teardrops and crocea spawning in the same tank, and they end up with some weird looking clams and think, yeah, well, these must be hybrids between those croceas and these noise that were over here, right? <laughs> but then it goes on to say, well, 65% of them are black with blue stripes like that one. That's a fairly common maxima, right? The problem here is, how, how the heck can you breed two teardrop maximas, two noise, and end up getting 65% black with a striped mantle. That shouldn't be the case. I mean, that's a, that's a maxima for sure, and teardrops are not maximas. So that's an odd one. 30% uh, are gold. Maximas and croceas come in gold. Some of them are green. Maximas and croceas both come in green. Right? And then a few of the hybrids, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. All right? I can tell you this, there's no, there's no croceas that look like that, and there's no teardrops that look like that. Okay? I gave that one a thumbs down. I think they got some weird looking croceas. Right? And I, I'm going to show you, I don't have pictures of those, but I'm going to show you some. I'll tell you this, I don't have any pictures, I don't use people's, even for something like this, I don't use people's pictures without getting permission. And some of these pictures, you know, you find them on the internet. It's just on somebody's site, so you don't know where they got that, and maybe they got that from somewhere. So I don't use, I don't have any pictures. I'll tell you this though, I've looked at lots of them, every single one, without exception. Every one of these uh, maxeas I've seen, I looked at and just said that's a crocea. I've never seen one that even made me wonder, like maybe that's a hybrid. <coughs> Maxman Noe. I gave it a sideways thumb. Not sure about this. Uh, the guy I got this information from is supposed to be very credible, very nice guy. You know, it's all, you only hear good things about him. I've communicated with him several times. Um, so he said that they had crossed Maxima in no way, regular Maxima with a teardrop. He said it seemed to work okay. Uh, but weird stuff was happening. Look, every time they tried to cross a teardrop with a regular Maxima, I said they never once got a teardrop. So that's odd. Uh, tried to do it with Squamosa and Maxima also, and always got Maxima. That's odd. But then I kept sort of asking questions like, well, are you sure it could have been like self-fertilization or some kind of, you know, this one made this one over here spawn and it's accidental? Give me some more details. And the problem is it comes back with, well, I mean, that's his own words. It's a personal observations. It's not a controlled experiment. So it doesn't mean they're not hybrids, but can't be sure either. What do you need? Genetic testing. I mean, there's no, there's no way to know, right? These have popped up numerous times. All right, here's your squamosa versus crocea, or excuse me, cross with crocea. Squamosa. <coughs> All right, crocea's over there, squamosa's right next to it. If you're gonna make a hybrid, that sounds pretty good. They're pretty closely related. So, all right, that sounds good so far, right? Now, croceas are called the boring clam. Remember a few minutes ago I was talking about we used to classify things whether, whether they made holes in rocks or lived on the sand and things like that. Croceas in the wild, 100% of the time, are down in rocks, right? They basically secrete a mild acid. I showed you that shell like the first slide and one of those shells had a big hole on the bottom. I'll show you again in a minute. They actually have a special tissue that comes out of the bottom of the shell. They secrete a mild acid, and they basically dissolve a hole down into rocks, limestone rocks, and they live in it. So typically when you find them, this was in Okinawa, you find them with the mantle, right flush with the surface like that. And the whole shell's down inside there. And then as they grow, they just make the hole bigger and bigger and bigger. 
right? So that's why it's called a boring clam. Look at the mantle, though. All right, dark with all the little light spots on it, and then it's got a little light rim right around the edge. And then I look over at this guy. It's got a little light rim around it, light-colored spots. There's another one, same thing. That is, that definitely looks like a crocea mantle. There are maximas that are blue that have spots, excuse me, that are black that have spots on them too, but the eyes are real different. And they don't have that light margin right around the edge of the mantle. So that definitely looks like a crocea's mantle. Okay, there's another one. See the light edge right here? Okay, now this is on a farm. That's why it's not in a hole. So that's aquaculture. It's the same thing though. Okay, so it's looking like a crocea mantle. Definitely. Now here's the problem though. Crocea's have smooth shells. Right, so those are all, that's just a mix of crocea shells. I mean, anytime you go out and hack, basically you have to chisel one out of the hole. But anytime you do that, they've always got a smooth shell. Uh, but look at this one over here. Scoots. It's got the little petals on the shell. Crocea is not supposed to have scoots. Squamosa has scoots. Take a look. Those are typical squamosa shells. So it looks like we've got something that's got a crocea mantle. The boring clams mantle, but has a shell with scoots on it. So that looks like, looks like a hybrid between crocea and squamosa. That would be a very easy mistake to make. I can, I can easily see where somebody would think that's a hybrid. It's not, though. Crocea's got the big hole in the bottom I was talking about. Squamosa's got a little small hole. Uh, I mean, that's pretty big for squamosa right there. Sometimes they've got no hole in the bottom, right? Let's look at some shells. That's a crocea, normal. That's a normal squamosa. And you see it's got the scoots on the shell. This was the hybrid that's in between. So it's got the kind of bigger than normal hole for a squamosa. But it's got these scoots all over it. Maybe the hole looks a little small for a crocea. So it, at first glance, it, that does look kind of in between, sort of. It's got the hole kind of like the crocea, but the scoots like a squamosa. But then I actually measured them. Uh, this is what I when you examine a parent hybrids, not just look at the mantle and say it looks weird. If I look at like the length to width ratio, uh, the, the width of the opening versus the width of the shell, the length of the opening versus the length of the shell, I find out like, ah, that shell, when you first glance at it, it looks kind of in the middle. It's really not though. Look how close the ratios are. One to 2.6, one to 2.8. There's your squamosa over there, one to 5.4. Your eyes will fool you sometimes. 1 to 4.8, 1 to 4.7, 1 to 9.4. So that shell is definitely a lot like a crocea shell, but it's got scoots on it. Well, here's the problem. Croceas make scoots. Lots of people don't know it or don't realize it, and you never would, because when we get croceas, they're very, very rarely farmed because they grow really slow. And farmers would like to have fast-growing clams, grow them and get them out of here. Uh, every once in a while, though, you'll find a crocea that's not all the way down in the rock. A little bit of the shell sticking out. And when that happens, you see that they do get scoots on them, like a squamosa. When you grow them on a farm completely, look at them. They look completely different. Scoots all over it. And again, that's only going to happen on a farm one because it's not living in a hole in a rock. So, that looks pretty much like the clam that's in the picture over there. That's it. That's just a farm crocea. That's not a hybrid even though they've been sold several times as hybrids. And again, sometimes it's, I mean, it's an honest mistake. Croceas aren't supposed to have scoots, but sometimes they do. And we hardly ever get farmed croceas here in the States. Uh, man, I said I was doing good on time now. Let's look at another one, Maxima and Squamosa. ORA. The guys are here, so I just, Actually, we've got some guys here that do this stuff. Just got to talk to them before this just for a few minutes, and all it did is confuse me more than I already was. So. They farm a bunch of these. All right, so they got squamosas, they got maximas. Uh, look at something like this, and I'll tell you, here's where we get confused. There was a big article uh, about these hybrids from ORA. And here there's three pictures from ORA of these hybrid clams they've made, so I just asked the guys, and this is in an article on a popular site, and I asked the guys from the farm, like, are these supposed to be hybrids? Because they look like squamosas to me. They said, no, that's not, those aren't hybrids. Picture shouldn't have been used in that article. What about these? I don't, those are weird looking. 
I'll tell you this, those are strange looking. When I first saw those, that, that got my attention. Those are peculiar looking. But then again, they look a lot like squamoses. And they, you guys kind of told me the same thing like that. They're probably just squamoses, right? These are actually ones that, that are potentially hybrids. And these are weird ones too. Again, when you look at these, if I had no idea what this is about, you just say, hey, James, here's a picture. Would you tell me what these clams are? I'd say, well, that's a squamosa. I'd say, that's a maxima, maxima, squamosa, squamosa, maxima, maxima, maxima. No problem for me. But the problem is that like, these all came from the same parents. And the shells on some of them, like this one looks like a squamosa shell with a, man, uh, with a maxima mantle. That looks like just a maxima. This one over here looks just like a maxima. Look at the one on the bottom right really, really well. Take a look at that color of that mantle and the pattern and the eyes. See the little black spots on the edge of it? And then the shell. See, it's got really big scoots, and they seem to be spaced out a lot compared to like these that are small and closer together. You know, it's, it's a subtle difference, but it is a difference. All right, well, here are some things that I know for a fact are maximas. That glam right there at the top right sure does look just like that one at the bottom. But that one's got a shell like a squamosa, and that one's got a shell like a maxima. So these are, I mean, if I've seen anything that I, I would think like that, that looks like a hybrid. That's it. Guess what? Still not sure without genetic testing. Not positive. Uh, the guys say that they've been doing this for a while. Again, just had a good conversation before this. They said on the farm they've been apparently doing it right, like getting the sperm and getting the eggs and mixing everything up right, and they seem to be convinced that they can do it with a few different species, right? So that's the closest thing I've gotten to like verification. And still there's all kinds of questions that I have and they have too, things that just kind of don't make sense. I think when they don't work, do work, terrible mortality, lots of stuff dies, then you get that question of self-fertilization again, so on and so forth. I'm gonna show you this too. These are maximus for sure, I forgot this slide. Those are squamosis for sure. So again, I go back to, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. So again, these are supposed to be crosses between squamosis and maximas. And sure enough, I see some of them that have a maxima mantle and a squamosa shell, and then we've got maximas that look like that, and we've got squamosas that look like that, so I can believe those are hybrids. I just say it again, though. I've never seen any other clams of any, any type that I really thought were hybrids, except for possibly those. Right? So I gave that one a sideways thumb too. I'd still want to see genetic testing. Just to be sure. But not a thumbs down or a thumbs up yet. All right, so there we go. I'm about to wrap this up. Uh, Hippopus and porcelanus. That turned out to be self-fertilization. -fertiliz that was proved with genetics. So that's psh, down. Maxima, no way. That was the Chinese study I showed you where they said none of the fertilized eggs live more than two days. Not sure if those were hybrids or maybe that was self-fertilization too. Not sure. I say nothing even grew big enough to test. Uh, the squamosa versus crocea, that was the blue one we were looking at with all the scoots. That's definitely not a hybrid. I, for sure that's not a hybrid. Uh, Maxima crocea, that was the squamosea. Every one of those I've seen, that's just a farmed crocea. Uh, so I gave that a thumbs down too. Squamosa maxima, that was the ORA stuff. Definite possibility, but can't be positive without the testing. Um, and then that was the one I was talking about from Reef Query in Volume 1, the Duras and Gigas, where Julian just said, I changed my mind. I don't think that's hybrid anymore, so we can get rid of that one. So we've got, what have we got here? A bunch of thumbs down and some thumbs this way. No thumbs up. Shoot. Anyhow, back to that scientific method. The next step would be develop a hypothesis. It is possible. I mean, other clams have done it. We've got guys that say they've done it. We've got some weird looking clams that look like they might be hybrid, so it's possible. There we go. How would I test it? Like in a lab. I mean, with a pipette, a petri dish. I'm going to give that egg and this sperm and so on and so very tightly controlled conditions to make sure you have no self fertilization or anything like that. Uh, or just do the genetic testing on them. Unfortunately, it's expensive. There you go. An ending that everybody hates. Sorry. <laughs> How about that? Definitely, we have not proved that these hybrids exist. It is not, it's far from proven. But it definitely has not been disproven either. 
has not been falsified. That's how science works. So there you go. I just felt right. <laughs>